All right, it's 6.30, we'll get started. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. Uh, tonight we are gonna be talking about composting, talking trash in the garden, uh, different ways to get uh, trash out of your house uh, or that food waste and how to turn it into something productive for your garden. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Just a couple quick housekeeping things. Uh, we are joined tonight with Heather from the Moore Public Norman, or excuse me, the Moore Library of the Pioneer Library System. Uh, she'll be moderating, checking the chat for me. Um, if you could, please keep yourself muted. There's background noise sometimes, and so um, I just if dogs bark or the doorbell rings, it it kind of helps out if you're muted. There is a survey in the chat. That is our pre-assessment. If you haven't done that yet, I'd appreciate you filling that out. Just kind of gives us an idea of uh, how we did tonight, where we start and where we end up, and kind of helps us tailor our programming a little bit better to you. I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see my screen? Thumbs up. Good, I'm getting some nods. Okay, good deal. All right. So I think I know everybody here tonight, but if you don't know me, my name is Courtney DeKalb Myers. I am the Cleveland County Horticulture Educator. Uh, so my job handles answering homeowner questions about tree diseases or how do I grow tomatoes or why isn't my lawn as pretty as my neighbors. I also manage our and advise our Cleveland County Master Gardeners uh, it's a great group of about 115 volunteers that help us get gardening information out into the public. And then I also teach workshops. Uh, since the, now that we are in the time of COVID, we have really kind of converted our workshops to webinars and I've been having a lot of fun. I hope you guys have been having a lot of fun uh, and we're gonna keep doing this, doing this for, for the foreseeable future, but I like it so far. So tonight we're talking about compost and what compost is, how we can use it in our garden, and maybe some troubleshooting and some tips and tricks uh, for how to really get that black gold that makes our plants grow. So first, I kind of want you all to think about uh, a forest untouched by, by humans and, and sort of kind of how that system would work without us being in that system. So the trees grow, they put out leaves, and then at the end of the season, those leaves drop, and those leaves fall back onto the forest floor. And as they're on the forest floor, they are eaten by earthworms, by other beneficial insects, by, and then they're broken down by fungi and bacteria. And they really sort of break down those leaves, and they break them down into the smallest, particles that they can back into the nutrients, back into the building blocks of what the tree needs. And it goes into the soil. And then the following year, the following season, or maybe a couple years down the road, as long as it takes those leaves to decompose, it's actually added back to the soil and the tree can kind of almost reuse those nutrients again to pull that up and to put out more leaves in the future. Now contrast that with a vegetable garden or maybe a landscape. So we have a very manipulated situation that we are growing plants in. We plant the plants, we pick their fruit for ourselves and we eat them and that's the goal. And then at the end of the season, if it's maybe annuals like cucumbers or tomatoes, we pull those plants up and we throw them away. So that soil never gets the building blocks that it has back when we have this more manipulated situation. And so that's really where the, uh, the motivation for composting comes into play. So we want to be able to add those building blocks back to the soil. So what is compost? Well, it's a very heavily, highly decomposed organic matter. And in that last bullet point, I say composting happens in the natural world. And that's really the idea of that forest floor scenario of where we want to take the material that we have, that, that plant material, and break it back down into building blocks for our plants. So kind of almost a cycle, that, that sustainable cycle. It's really broken down uh, by bacteria and fungi. And it adds those, like I said, 
those nutrients and those building blocks back to the soil so that the plant can continue to produce and continue to be productive. So what are some of the benefits of composting? Um, well, the big one is it reduces the amount of material going into landfills. So I have a statistic here. It's a little bit older, uh, about 15 years old, but, about, but it says about 13% of yard waste, 12% of food waste, and 34% of paper is what makes up the municipal waste that goes to the landfill. Um, and so that, sure, that was from 15 years ago, and hopefully maybe that's gone down a bit. Um, I know in Norman, uh, we have a city composting center, and so that does divert a lot of our yard waste, but we still have the food waste and the paper. And, and there's some research, and if you really want to dive into um, kind of how the sausage is made, more or less, the, when the food waste ends up in the municipal waste in the landfills, it, it really doesn't break down properly. and causes a lot of bad chemicals to release in that process when it doesn't happen, uh, excuse me, when it happens in that highly manipulated landfill as composed to a composting situation. Um, so other than that, there are more benefits than that, if I haven't convinced you already, is it's essentially, it's a free soil amendment. It's a way to add material um, nutrients back to your soil and it essentially is free. Once you get your setup, once you have your system, it doesn't really cost anything to maintain it. And you are able to use it back into your soil um, as opposed to having to buy maybe more traditional fertilizers. It also increases the amount of beneficial organisms in the soil. So as you create that compost, that compost is filled with microbial, um, microbial web of organisms. And when you add that back to your soil, it really sort of increases the population of those beneficial microbial organisms in your soil. And plants and those beneficial organisms really do have a symbiotic relationship and they help each other out. And so it's a really good thing when you have more beneficial organisms in your soil. So I know we think fungi and bacteria, maybe our mind initially goes to the bad pathogens, the, plant, the pathogens that make our plants sick. But there are a lot of really good organisms that we want to really foster within our soil. Um, and it also improves soil quality. Uh, so that includes tilth, which is kind of a word to describe how spongy the soil is. Uh, it increases the air pockets within the soil. It increases how much nutrients that soil is able to hold onto. And then it also helps with the water retention and helping to hold that soil, hold water in soil for a longer period of time. Um, and so I do have, uh, I apologize if you are in the improving soil uh, quality class, you've seen these slides before, but it is still relevant. So you think of the two problem soil types that you might have, say clay soil or sandy soil, uh, either two ends of those spectrums. And the issue with clay soil a lot of times is we really struggle with drainage. So the particles are very, very small and there's not a lot of air pockets. And so when it rains, that water really has to move around all those small air pockets in order to effectively drain. And so that can create, if we, especially in Oklahoma, have those really heavy May rains that just six inches overnight, and you have clay soils, it's really going to sit for a long time if that soil is not well aerated. Now, if you add compost or organic matter to that situation, what it does is it essentially creates aggregates. So that compost will help those clay particles sort of lump together, kind of act as a magnet almost, and creates more pore space for water and for air within the soil. And so when we get a rain, it drains much quicker. When you're a root and you're trying to navigate through that soil profile, it's much easier to move through because those pore spaces are much larger. So that's uh, essentially how compost can help out a very heavy clay soil. Now contrasting that with sandy soil, um, sandy soil really struggles with uh, nutrient holding capacity. 
So being able to hold on to those nutrients and supply them essentially to the plant. So the nutrients are really held on the surface area of the, of the soil particles. And so the surface area, oh, excuse me, um, my next slide. So in sandy soils, you know, drainage is, drainage is pretty easy for sandy soils because those pore spaces are so much larger. But like I was saying, the nutrient holding capacity is much lower because the nutrients are held with on the surface area of the soil particles. And when you have bigger particles, there's less overall surface area for your sandy particles. So now you add compost to it and it increases the amount of surface area. So those are just some examples of how compost can really enhance some of your problem soils. So if you have a very heavy clay soil, uh, continually adding compost to that to sort of try and break it up, increase the amount of pore space within those heavy soils uh, can really help with some of those problems. So there are a lot of local sources and I'm not sure if everybody in here is from, is in Cleveland County, so I apologize if you're not. Um, but these are just a couple places that you can get local sources of compost. Minick has a couple different um, batches of compost that they sell. Markham's has a very popular compost, uh, the red bud compost that they create um, and they bag, they create it themselves. I've seen the facility is really cool and they, they bag it themselves and it's a pretty good product. And then also, like I mentioned, we have a citywide compost facility for the city of Norman and they can haul off our yard waste and they compost it themselves and then they release it back out. But um, all of these are different places that you can get sources for compost, but it is so rewarding to make it yourself. Um, and not only to say that, but you also know exactly what's going into it. Um, so sometimes I, I'll hear comments about the city of Norman compost, how it maybe brought in some weeds or Maybe you got some other compost from a friend and you're not really sure what was in it and your plants aren't super happy. But if you make your own compost and you're really controlling the situation and you know, uh, you know exactly what went into it. So getting started for creating a, a, a compost facility or a compost setup at your home, you wanna find a good location. Um, it's not fun to move a compost uh, set up because it's a, essentially quite a bit of um, material that you end up with. So make sure you start out with a good spot. Uh, you want it to be sunny. Uh, compost likes to stay hot and so you want it really kind of to be in the sun but you don't want it to be too terribly hot. Um, maybe if you have like an afternoon, if you can provide a little bit of afternoon shade to cool it off in the heat of the summer, that can be beneficial. Ideally, you would want it maybe on bare soil, and that way the beneficial microbes that are within the soil can actually come up and join your compost bin and really sort of have a marriage there to be a little bit more localized to what's in your garden. You want it to be level. Don't put it on um, a slope or anything. If it starts to uh, erode, if we get like a big heavy rain, and then it starts to wash off, you know, that's, that's not quite fun either. You don't want it to be, you want it to be slightly protected from wind. Again, if it gets really windy, you don't want those particles picking up and blowing all over the place. You also want to make sure that there's plenty of room to spread out. You're gonna be turning this compost pile. Um, and if you're really kind of in there digging it with your shovel and moving it around or with a pitchfork or something, you don't want it to be too close up next to a building. Um, also easily accessible. Make sure if it's, you're more likely to do it and to contribute to your compost if you make it easy for yourself to do that. So if you put it out like a mile away from your kitchen door, you're not going to take it out there. You don't want to have to walk out that far. So make sure it's easy to access before, uh, before you get it set up. You also want it to be near the garden. If it's a mile away from the garden, you're not going to want to have to haul that back, haul that back over to the garden. Also near a water source because it will need uh, routine watering and you want, you don't want to have to haul that water to your compost. And then not against the house. So I will admit this picture on the right, this is my house. <laughs> and I put my compost bin way too close to the house. And occasionally we have some bugs. Um, 
that hang out in the compost bin. And I think they also get into my house when they're hanging out in the compost bin. But I will say it's very easily accessible. It's pretty close to the back door. So, but ideally not super close to the house. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a general idea of where you want to put the compost bin. There are a lot of different systems. There is, you can watch a hundred videos on YouTube and find a hundred different ways to build a compost bin. There is no one way to do it. And so these are just some examples of some composting options. So this is from our fact sheet, Backyard Composting in Oklahoma. Uh, the garbage can or barrel is a very easy way to do it where you would just kind of have that in, uh, have that placed into it. You wanna make sure there's holes in it for aeration. Uh, that way the air is able to get in there and feed those microbes because they do need oxygen. Now, uh, commercial, there's a lot of different commercial ones, and it really comes down to how much you're willing to spend on, on, the, uh, on the compost setup. Uh, that particular rendering there is of a tumbler, and those are really nice. It's kind of like the Cadillac of composting setups. Um, but what it is essentially is you can rotate it and actually crank it, and that'll do the turning for you. And we'll go over why turning is important here in a little bit. Um, but those do tend to be fairly expensive. There is the uh, three system setup, and this is probably one of the more ideal ways to have a compost setup um, if you have the space for it. And the cool thing about these three sectioned compost bins is you can have compost at different stages. So you can have a almost finished compost, a compost that is actively composting, and then a compost that you're contributing your scraps to. Um, and so different ways to build those, of course, compost or concrete blocks, or you using pallet wood, um, lots of different ways that you can build those. And then there's also just having the one singular section, which is just as good too. Um, but again, lots of different ways, lots of different materials that you can do to build that. Oh, and I, I guess I forgot to mention, if you have any questions, please put those in the chat. Heather, have we had any questions yet? No? Okay. So we just been com commented a little bit about what we do and here's how to contact me. And then I have rotator number two or composter number two. Okay, cool. I see the little thing going off. And so I'm like, wait, Sorry. I know somebody's talking in the chat. So I need to make sure and make sure. Well, I was just going to tell you what, when you said yucky bugs, I had these things fall out yesterday and I felt like I was watching the Star Trek where they put stuff in someone's ears, but they move like a maggot and they plopped out and I couldn't stand looking at them. I had to fling them across the, I was like, I gotta get you out of my vision. They, you think they were earwigs maybe with the little pinchers on the back of them? No, they looked like a, they weren't a caterpillar, but they looked kind of like a maggot looks, but about, I would say an inch long and they were black and they had nothing, no, no feeler. Okay. I think I might have a picture of it later. Oh no, I don't know if I want to see that. I'm sure they were beneficial, just not plopping out on the ground. Not plopping out. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll talk about bugs here in a little bit. Oh no, okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, we were going to go into bugs tonight. No. So, uh, so getting started, some things. Um, so, you know, before you pick your system, you know, here are just some considerations. So how much volume will you be composting? Is it just you and your kitchen scraps? Um, then you probably don't maybe need a three-tier composting system if it's just you and your kitchen scraps. Uh, how much do you want to spend on your composting system? Essentially, you know, that you can just put a pile in your backyard and manage that pile and that's absolutely free with no um, with, with no structure built even or if you want to use repurposed materials do the DIY way or purchase a or a tumbler or something like that. It's, so how much do you want to spend on your composting system and then how much do you care about looks too? Because uh, if you're kind of concerned you want to keep it pretty you might go with one of those. Uh, commercial to really sort of hide what's going on but hey if if you don't have people in that part of your yard and it doesn't bother you then then you can kind of do whatever you want so just kind of sort of ask yourselves those questions as you're getting started 
So what goes in the pile? Uh, so pretty much um, there is a lot of a lot of things that can go in your pile and I think the more you kind of start to look into it maybe more goes into your pile than you actually can uh, than you actually know. So really pretty much any yard waste. So grass clippings, pine needles, leaves, uh, just any material that you pull out of the ground um, can go in your can go in your compost bin. Uh, so but if you're a word of caution though, if you put anything that has seeds in your compost bin, there's a chance those seeds might not get burned out. So if you're weeding and those weeds have lots of flowers, lots of seeds, and you put those in your compost bin, they might proliferate when you go to use that compost. So that's just a word of caution. So pretty much if it doesn't have seeds and you're not worried about its proliferation, it can go in there. Uh, produce scraps. So as you're cooking in the evening and you're peeling a potato and then you chop off the end of some celery, you chop off the end of some carrots, uh, maybe you're making a nice stew, you end up with all this trash essentially. So if you hold on to that, that can be then added back to your compost bin. Newspaper is a great addition to your compost bin. Uh, junk mail too, maybe, uh, any paper. Just make sure it doesn't have any plastic on it. Um, chipped branches, you want them to be, uh, you don't want them to be too big because uh, that will take quite a long time to break down. But if you chip them or maybe you cut them into smaller pieces, those can also be great additions to your compost bin. Coffee grounds, tea leaves, those can go as well. Make sure if you're doing pre-bag tea to actually cut the tea leaves out of the tea bag uh, and watch for staples and things like that. And then if you're doing coffee grounds, um, you can do the coffee filters if they are unbleached, uh, but be very hesitant if you're doing it with the bleached coffee filters because that can slowly add up and add some chemicals back to your compost bin. But the unbleached ones should compost just fine. And then eggshells as well. Uh, they're, they're a great one to add to, though uh, try and before you throw them in your compost bin to crunch them up into much smaller pieces so they can break down much quicker. Because they're break down, they probably break down one of the slowest. Courtney? So does, yes. Sorry, we have a lot of questions that, do you want to wait until you're finished with this part? or No, I'll take questions. I can take questions now. Okay, so it looks like I have black fly black soldier fly maggots because I went and looked those up and then let's see I apologize Andrea okay um she has a question if she clips leaves off her plants in her garden because they have leaf borers or fungus or virus should those go in the compost bin so no more or less more or less no so in an ideal situation, when you're composting, the compost will heat up. If you've got uh, a good ratio of, of particular things, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And when it heats up, it should break down all weed seeds, all chemical fertilizer, or all herbicides and pesticides, and all fungi, bacteria, and insects. If you don't have a compost thermometer, and you're not actively checking the compost to make sure it stays at this uh, that particular temperature for a sustained period of time, I wouldn't mess with it. Because if you put it in there and it maybe doesn't cook out the way it's supposed to, you're just gonna add it back to your soil. So it's, it's just kind of a, you know, if it was an ideal situation where you're constantly checking that temperature to make sure uh, then, it, then in an ideal situation, it would work. But because some of us, you know, we don't have the compost thermometer, or we're not quite checking it, uh, or maybe we don't do it for a long enough period of time, then some of those things aren't going to cook out the way they should. So yes, my rotator I, one, that I, I don't think that would work in mine then. I'm glad, yeah. you're, I'm glad you asked that question. So <laughs> then one other one is, are you going to talk about compost tea later? Or could we talk about that now if you're going to? I don't have a slide necessarily on compost tea, but I would like to save that one until we get to the worms. Okay. That's Hang on okay. just a second. 
I got to go a little bit more down. Oh, Tanya shared that she has the biggest, best acorn squash that's growing on the edge of her compost pile from some of the acorn seeds that had been put into the pile. So yeah. she's going to make it and bake it and share it, right? <laughs> That's what I think. Next webinar. Well, I'll eat mm -hmm. Tanya's, <laughs> Tanya's acorn <shall> gosh. <laughs> okay, that looks like we're, I think we're caught up. If we okay. haven't, let me know and I'll catch you on the next one. Okay, so here, here answers some of those questions. So what does not go in the compost pile? So anything fatty, no meat, dairy products, fish, no, don't throw out the cooking oil in the compost bin. Um, that does not get broken down the same way. Don't do bones. If you have leftover chicken bones, those are not gonna compost either. Plastics do not get uh, composted. And if they did get composted, remember we're talking about building blocks. They're not gonna break down into the building blocks that we want. So don't do plastic, anything plastic in your, in your compost bin. Diseased plants. So again, it's best to avoid diseased plants if you can. And then weeds and vegetables that produce abundant seeds. So I know uh, we were talking about acorn squash and I've seen uh, one year we had a spaghetti squash come out of our compost bin. So sometimes it can be kind of fun, but if you don't want that coming out of your compost bin, don't put those heavy seeds in there. And then also pet or human waste. Uh, it's not, we're not herbivores. We don't eat um, in a way that that, you know, in nature, if a deer poops in the forest versus, versus something else, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same. So don't put it, don't put it in your compost bin. As much as I wish that, you know, I didn't have to throw kitty litter away at the end of the day, uh, don't put it in your compost bin. It's, it's not, no, don't do that. Do you have to wash the eggshells, Courtney, from the, wash the goo off or? That's probably a good idea to wash the goo off. Um, I, I can't tell you whether or not, I haven't read anything that said do that um, or don't do that, but typically the, the, microbe, the microbes aren't going to be able to break down the yolk and the whites. So if you wash those off and it's less of that sort of material, that's not going to, um, that's not going to break down the same way. So you could, I imagine if you did it over, if you did it, it's just a little bit. And so it's not going to maybe affect the overall symbiosis of your compost bin, but it, it, it's probably a good idea. Excuse me. So creating the best ratio. So when we are composting, we really, um, there's this kind of idea of browns and greens. And if we have the right ratio of browns to greens, then the compost is able to happen, it heats up to the right temperature, and it breaks down in a way that actually becomes compost. If our ratio gets a little bit off, we start to see problems, we might get some funny odors, and, and we just don't get, the, we don't get the product that we want quite, quite yet. Um, so the ratio for browns to greens is three to one, um, and so brown is really uh, items that have a lot of carbon, and then the greens are items that have a lot of nitrogen. Uh, so you might hear three to one brown to green or three to one carbon to nitrogen, uh, but that's kind of the idea of what we want. So for your browns, um, so those are kind of think, I mean, they do tend to be more like brown items. Um, so dry leaves, wood chips, um, the newspaper or straw, those items are our browns. And then the greens are more items that are going to come out of our kitchen. So the fruit peels, the vegetable scraps. Um, I have grass clippings on here as the green, but I will say if they're dry grass clippings, then they essentially become the brown. Um, so kind of sort of depends on what stage your grass clippings are in. Uh, and then the tea leaves and the coffee, those are all considered greens. Um, and then anything that's kind of a fresh plant material as well. So like I said, we want a three to one ratio of these items. So speeding it up. Compost can take, um, it can vary depending on the temperature that we have, depending on 
um, sort of the setup you have, but it does kind of tend to take a few months or so. So if you want to speed it up and you want that material in your garden sooner, here are some tips. So frequently turning your compost. We have to turn the compost um, when we have it so that we can add air back to, uh, back to those microbes. Those microbes need air and water in order to effectively do their job and break down that material. So when you turn it, you're adding air back into the, into the soil, into that compost bin. And those microbes are able to sort of pick up faster. They kind of have more fuel when you do that. And so they'll break it down faster. Uh, also make sure to keep the material moist by soaking it once a week. So like I said, they need water and water and oxygen. So kind of watering it down, making sure that it's moist. Uh, typically the analogy I've heard is like a wrung out sponge. So any more wet than that and you're going to end up with less oxygen and those microbes not be, might not be so happy in that situation. Uh, so kind of keeping a good balance by just keeping it health, healthfully, is that a word, healthfully moist. Um, and then also breaking down the materials into smaller pieces. So that's kind of the logic, you know, we were talking about the twigs and, you know, you don't want to just put big branches or stumps into your compost bin. It's going to take a very long time for those microbes to eat that. So you chop it up into smaller bites for them and they're able to break that down much faster. Uh, so those are some of the ways that you can speed the composting process up. And then also monitoring the temperature. Um, so we've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but the natural composting process uh, kind of happens between 140 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. We really sort of want to stick within the 120 to 140 range. Um, any hotter than that, and it might start to kill the microbes. So if we sort of stay in that active spot, then that will really keep the, the microbes happy. And that's really how we know that the process is happening. Um, it's a good idea um, to purchase a compost thermometer. I will admit I don't have one. I don't have a compost thermometer, but it is, a, uh, it is an ideal situation to have to be able to monitor the heat of your compost. So you're making sure that things are happening when you monitor it. And also can confirm that you've got your ratio right. So if your three to one ratio gets just a little bit off, um, it might not be heating up the same way that it should be. So you can kind of sort of confirm that you're doing things right when you've got a, a compost thermometer. And I was looking at these on Amazon and they run like 20 to $25. But how it works is it's really, it's just a thermometer, but it's got a very long probe on it that you can stick into the compost. So with composting, um, you know, make it easy on yourself. Like we said, put it somewhere accessible, but they sell lots of little totes like this um, where you can actually keep it under your kitchen and then be able to take that out once it gets full. It doesn't have to be something fancy. You can repurpose. Um, you could do something like a coffee bin. I just had this sitting on my desk. You're probably wondering why I had that sitting on my desk, but. Um, that is just something you can repurpose like that to be able to take out to your compost bin. Um, so, you know, I, when I'm cooking, will put my compost sort of tote in the sink. And just as I am chopping my vegetables, I stick it in there. And then at the end of a meal, I take it out to the compost bin. So it's just kind of a way to make it easier on yourself. Um, so some examples, and this is actually Tanya's composting pile that she sent me a picture of and was nice enough to let me use as an example. But there are lots of different ways to do composting and compost, uh, create compost setup. So Tanya here has a pile. Um, and so she turns this frequently. And I think she mentioned she also lives on some acreage. And so she'll add uh, some of the grass and some of the material as her browns to the compost pile and continually mixes that for her. And she she said that her dog was supposed to be posing, but he didn't know that he was posing. Uh, this is another Master Gardener's setup that they were gracious enough to let me use as an example. These are called geo bins, uh, and they're actually sort of plastic mesh that you can use and lock together to create these tunnel types. And so she said she had five of them 
that she uses to um, monitor her compost at different stages. And this is the one, this is the three compost bin system in the Master Gardener demo garden. So again, it is another, uh, it's a three system. So we have the compost here at different stages and we have a lot of material that comes out of that, uh, out of that demo garden. So a lot of weeds and things and branches and stuff that we pull out, um, they actually will chip shred everything before putting it into, into the first pile and then we'll screen it and work through it that way. Um, so, you know, we used to start out with a pretty sort of large, loose material and it gets worked down slowly over time into something that can be used in the garden. So, do we have any questions at this point? We yes. have one. Okay. Um, so, Andrea said that she has no problems with things breaking down but it's not hot or even warm. She wonders, because they have those black fly soldier maggots, mm -hmm. that maybe it's more the maggots and not bacteria. Is that possible? That's very possible. Um, usually, I think if it's, um, actually that's my next slide, so we'll just go in a different, we'll go in a different order. Um, so if it's not heating up, um, it could be a, a number of different things, but possibly the maggots are doing the work for you instead of the microbes. Um, if you've got a whole ton of them, um, a couple of those maggots is not a big deal, but if you've got a ton of them, then they're essentially eating it up before the microbes are eating it up. Um, and a lot of times, the if you get the black soldier fly maggots in your compost bin, it's or your compost setup, it's a symptom of maybe having too much nitrogen in the soil in it and so if you've got mostly kitchen scraps and mostly green material um, you might want to uh, just go back get a bag of maybe hay or mulch and add it back in there add the browns back in there to get that balance back up um, because the black soldier flies will really go after it if you have um, too much green in your compost bin. And like okay. I said, it's not bad in a small amount having a few of them in there, but if they're doing all the work for you, then um, the microbe, then they're eating it all before the microbes get to it. So would newspaper work then? Yes, shredded okay. newspaper would work too. Because mm -hmm. I'm not going to put my, I, I think I'm not going to use my grass because don't hurt me anybody, but I get my yard treated with my mm -hmm. HOA and so I didn't think it was safe to put it in there so yeah I would maybe go with um the shredded shredded newspaper okay thank you um so if your uh if your compost bin isn't heating up it's, it's going to be maybe a sign that your ratio is a little bit off also could be that there's not enough oxygen in there essentially those microbes they're not doing their work they're not doing their job so we need to get them in there we need to make sure that they're doing their job um, oh, so turning the pile, sorry. I'm sorry, she added that it's like sludge. So yeah, it's, that could all, yeah, it's probably yeah. too moist and, um, you might also try turning it more often too. Um, if your, um, soldier, they don't like to be disturbed, the soldier fly larva. And so if you're turning it a bunch, they're like, oh, I don't, I don't like this too much. Um, and then, so they're not as likely to maybe proliferate within your, within your compost bin. Um, but I, I understand cause that's, that's, my compost is pretty close to that too. I'll say right now I'm working on trying to get it better. Um, so yeah, like I said, turn pile, um, if you're not heating up, like kind of in your situation, it sounds like, um, maybe you've got too much nitrogen, but possibly if you're not seeing the maggots and it's not heating up quite right. Um, it could be that you don't have enough nitrogen in there. So if it's mostly yard debris, pot leaves, things like that, you might need to add in some of that nitrogen. And then it also might be that it's simply not big enough. Um, you really want your compost setup in your compost pile to be a 27 cubic feet. So that would be three by three by three. Um, so if it's not that big, it might not be enough really to sort of get working and get working on that those microbes to start breaking it down. 
Um, whoa. Okay. So another symptom, uh, a troubleshooting of something's going wrong is bad odor. So compost, it's a common misconception that compost stinks. Um, it should not stink. If it stinks, something's going wrong. Um, so some possible causes could be that it's too wet, maybe it's too compacted, um, or there's not enough oxygen or in anaerobic conditions. So again, those are beneficial microbes. They're being lazy. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And some of the more, um, the less beneficial microbes have taken over and they're putting off an odor. Um, so we want to kind of kick it into gear, get those, get those beneficial microbes working. Again, so things that we can do to kind of help with that uh, is turn the pile. So get oxygen back into that pile. Also add, oh, I misspelled coarse. That should be COA, uh, But add coarse dry materials. So the, um, the newspaper, the wood chips, the dried leaves, kind of adding that in to sort of loosen it back up. Um, also making sure it's not getting rained on. Um, if you know a big heavy rain is going to come through and you don't want your compost bin to be soaked, maybe cover it with a tarp. Um, or if you have, um, or if you want to invest in like an enclosed system, then that can be another option as well. So um, if rodents are attracted to your compost bin, um, it's possible that maybe some inappropriate food scraps got in there. Rodents don't really like to eat um, rats really go after fats and oils and things like that, and those shouldn't be showing up in the compost bin. Um, if it's things like mice or maybe possums are digging around in there, um, they're probably looking, the possums are probably looking for insects, the mice might be going after um, some of your plant material, but if it really bothers you, maybe investing in a rodent resistant bin uh, with a top, bottom, and side. Um, if you, um, if you're noticing that you're putting your food scraps in there and maybe mice are going after that, another thing you can do is bury that much deeper in your compost. So every time you take your compost out and you want to put it into your pile, uh, your food scraps, actually dig it in there so that the animals have to work for it in order to get it. And then uh, insects. So containing insects in your, in your compost bin, this is a good sign. This is a good sign. Um, in moderation. So things if you find earwigs or earthworms, slugs, maggots, all of those insects are decomposers. So they're in there actually kind of doing the work with the microbes. Now if you've got too much and it's not coming out the way you want it to, um, that could be causing some problems. Um, and then um, if it really does bother you and you don't want insects in there too much, Turning it frequently will keep them from hanging out. They don't want to be disturbed. They have found this great oasis with lots of decomposable material that they can chew on. And when you know when insects are happy, they tend to proliferate and uh, they tend to take over. So if you've got a this perfect oasis for them where they can just come have a feeding frenzy, um, they're going to take over. So turning that pile frequently so that they don't get too comfortable uh, can be a way to sort of uh, help, with, help with them getting in there and, and taking over. But these are the uh, black soldier fly maggots. This I uh, took over the weekend in my compost bin. Um, but they, um, like we've been talking about, are ferocious, ferocious decomposers. Um, so having some of them in your compost bin is really not, um, it's not the end of the world. Um, they're going to get in there um, because the black soldier flies are out and, and laying their eggs and they see, oh, this perfect oasis. And so they'll lay their eggs in there. So they, they will get in there if, if there's holes and everything into your compost bin. Um, but again, if they take over, they're really not doing the work for you. Um, or they're they're not really, they're doing it before the microbes are and you kind of end up with a different product um, that might not be as attractive or as easy to use as microbial compost. So moving on to vermicomposting, which is using uh, worms to do the composting for you. So a little less gross than the maggots, I like to think. Um, 
But so this is where you, the worms are doing the work for you instead of the black, or not the black salt flower, the microorganisms. So they're actually eating the material and then their castings or their poop is what we use in the garden. So some benefits of a vermicompost bin is you don't have to turn it. So it's a little bit less work in that regard. It doesn't heat up, so you don't have to necessarily monitor the temperature as closely as you do or watch your ratios as much. Um, and then it's also smaller in scale. So if you're in a condo or an apartment and you don't have the big layout that you want for your, your compost setup, then worms can be a great alternative. Now you do have to purchase red wigglers. Um, they are a type of worm that stays very close to the top of the soil. And what they do is they burrow up and they'll eat a little bit of the material that sits on the soil and they come back down. Um, so, you know, if you think about that forest floor analogy, the worms are on the forest floor, they'll come up, chew, go back down, and they pull that organic material back into the soil. Um, so garden worms and night crawlers are not what will really work. They like to burrow very deeply or they like to go side to side and they're not as productive within that little climate that we can create in a worm bin. So make sure to get red wigglers if you're setting up a compost bin. Um, red wigglers are much, much smaller than the garden worms that we might find when we're digging out in our garden. So worm bins are available for purchase. You can get on Amazon and get these super cool stackable ones. But my gosh, the DIYs are so easy. And they are so easy. Today, I went and bought materials and made one so I could have pictures to show you what it actually looks like. So this is what I did at work today, <laughs> among other stuff. But um, so I built a DIY worm bin. So the materials that you need, um, three, I bought 20 gallon totes, but I've read generally like 15 to 50 gallons, just depending on what, um, how much space you want to devote to it and how much material you have, um, how much waste material you have. You want a bedding material and so that is what is in the blue bucket there um, and that kind of sort of gives them like a starter and I'll go over that a little bit more. And then you also want shredded newspaper. So the de so worms, they like a ratio that's a bit more higher in carbon than they do in nitrogen. So you really have to add shredded newspaper pretty frequently and stay on top of that um, so that they stay happy. It's a good idea to have a little bit of soil from your garden too. Worms eat, um, as they move through the soil, they're used to eating, they're used to moving through the soil and eating a little bit of soil. And it kind of actually serves as a way and a grit in their digestive systems to really break down the material that they're feeding on. Uh, and then you also need worms for your worm bin. So to get started, um, in the top of two, two of your, your bins, you want to drill about eighth inch holes and that's for aeration. You want to do it on the sides of the bin and not on the top. That way, in case for any reason, liquid or something were to spill on top of the bin, it doesn't go straight on into your worms. So if you have it on the side, it still sort of serves as some circulation for your worms. And then you want to do to drill uh, quarter inch holes for drainage on the bottom at about a two inch to um, grid there on the bottom, and those are for drainage and for worm movement. Um, so those aeration, we want those to be a bit smaller, so the flies and the spiders and the things that like to get into dark, moist places um, don't have as big of an entryway hole, but on the bottom, when we're using it for drainage and worm movement, they can be a little bit bigger. So I go with like a quarter inch hole on the bottom. And like I said, we want to do this on two, two of the worm bins. Um, and that's so we can stack them. You want to be able to, uh, you don't have to build a stackable worm bin, um, but it is a, um, it's a good idea kind of to help them move uh, and it makes it much easier to harvest. So I think I've got a picture kind of demonstrating that later. So 
The other thing you want to is shredded newspaper and then bedding material. Um, so like I said, the bedding material is just kind of a sort of a starter. So you can use already finished compost as a starter if you have some or bedding material. Um, cocoa core um, or in the picture I used sphagnum peat moss that I had on hand at work. So um, I was able to use that and you want about a um, one to one ratio of each of these. And so you'll put that in your worm bin. Um, and so put those in one of your worm bins and then what you'll do is you'll stack those on top of each other. So it really works that when you're ready to go and you harvest your vermicompost, what you can do is actually move the bottom one and put it on top. And then that way the worms are able to move through because remember, like I said, those red wigglers, they like to stay towards the top of the soil. So they'll move back up. And then that second bin where they were previously will have all the vermicompost without any of the worms and you can go and then use that in your garden. And then the third bin that's on the bottom, that's really used to capture any water or anything that drains out of your, comp of your vermicompost bin. So, then put your worms in the compost and then, uh, and then you would begin to feed them. So start out slow. Worms will kind of match the environment that they're in. So if you are feeding them frequently, they will size up in number to take that volume, but give them time. So you don't start out with very many. So just give them time to eat what you're feeding them and then they will continue to grow um, into, into a productive worm bin. So this is the one at the Master Gardener Demo Garden, but I just kind of wanted to show this one too. It's the same con concept. Um, it was built with uh, cinder blocks and then on top it's kind of got a screen and some carpet to sort of keep some of the material out of there. Um, and I will say, you know, we think, um, you know, to keep them outside in the winter in the heat, but this, this has, is insulated enough that they stay, they've stayed through there. So like I said, again, the, newspaper on top you pull that back and you will find you will find the worms so it's the same sort of setup um so some tips on vermicomposting optimum temperature for the worms is 60 degrees to 75 degrees fahrenheit they can tolerate the cooler temperatures a little bit better than they can tolerate the warmer temperatures um, so this time of year really not a good idea to keep your worm bin in your garage um, probably going to heat up too much and cook those little guys. Um, it does tend to stay a little bit wetter than the microbial compost, so just kind of sort of be aware of that. You want to be able to keep it moist in there for them, um, but not so much that it's leaching out. Um, if it's draining too much and you're getting a lot of that runoff, um, it's probably a sign that it's too wet. Um, like I said, a higher carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, so continually adding those, um, continually adding newspaper and things like that and your mail maybe um, to it can, can help them out. Uh, you want to avoid things like citrus peels. Citrus peels, um, they don't like it too much. They don't have very exciting, spicy, tasty flavor. They like it things a little bland. And so um, you wanna avoid things like citrus peels, but also super hot spicy peppers and onions, they tend to avoid as well. Um, and then also kind of a cool thing with vermicomposting. So if you're not super happy with the finished product of your compost, um, you know, you might kind of be like, eh, this doesn't really look broken down as much as I want. Um, you can actually vermicompost your finished compost. Uh, and so they'll finish it off a little bit for you, um, kind of, and sort of create that more uniform product that you want. Heather, do we have any questions right now? Yes. Back okay. to you real quick. The, how often should you rotate the cylindrical composter? Um, the, like the crank one? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like that. Um, I would say, I know for a pile, um, you want to do it about once a week. Um, and so I would say with that one, since they tend to stay a little bit smaller 
you might do, and since it's just easier, you might do maybe twice a week, really sort of get cranking upper arm workout. Um, generally the rule of thumb with any compost is once a week, but um, with the rotating, it might be easier to do it more often. Because if you do it more often, it happens quicker. I do um, it daily. You do it what? I do it daily. The cousins that gave me mine said rotate it. I think she said 10 times around daily. So that's 10 what times I do. around daily. Yeah. Yeah, so, no, that, it should, it wouldn't hurt to, okay. to do it more often, but it, I guess it just depends on how often you want that upper arm workout. Okay, and then another question was, is it okay to use shredded printer paper? I'm just knowing that it might be bleached. Yes, I think if you use it in a like moderate amount, it should be okay. Um, Cause I've seen that where you add um, like leftover mail or anything like that. Um, you just wanna be cautious of like that plasticky paper, you know, um, like, like magazine, I think material that has kind of sort of a gloss to it. I would just try and avoid that as best you can. Any other questions? Oh, I guess this is now a good time to talk about the compost tea. Um, I guess I didn't put a slide in here, but so for compost tea, I, um, I haven't made it myself personally but I was um, doing a little bit of research on it, getting ready for it. And from what I have read and seen, um, you don't really want to like use necessarily what just comes off the drainage off of your bin. So that is, it might not be finished. It might sort of still be um, in the process of being broken down. You want to actually use finished vermicompost and steep that. And so that can be um, a good addition to your garden. And it's great because then it sort of turns it into like a liquid and you can actually spray it onto your plants. Um, and that might make it a little bit easier than having to lug out the vermicompost and add it back in. Um, so sort of kind of enhances it a little bit. Now I will say I, um, I did see um, like a blogger who was steeping it and then bubbling it and adding molasses to it to actually feed those microbes in it and sort of make like a very concentrated tea. Um, but I, I haven't seen any maybe um, scientific research that shows whether or not that's um, as effective or needed. Um, but I think it's something really cool that I definitely want to try out and see if that maybe works better than um, just adding the, the steeped tea itself. So using compost in the garden. Um, so if we want to add either the vermicompost or the microbial compost, work that into about the top six inches of the soil. Those top six inches are really sort of the main root profile of most of the crops or the flowers and landscaping that we will actually be growing. Um, so that's kind of a good idea. Um, now do pay attention to, um, if you are paying attention, excuse me, let me start over. If you are paying close attention to your temperature, um, then you can kind of use it a little bit more freely, maybe use it as mulch. Um, but if you are putting in um, material, like disease material or weed seeds or anything that maybe was sprayed with a uh, chemical pesticide, um, you maybe want to be kind of cautious about how you use it and then or apply it into your soil and work it into your soil a few months before you plan to plant into that area. Um, so just kind of sort of the, the cautionary note there is, so for example, if you were maybe you trimmed on a plant that, uh, maybe a landscaping plant that had a lot of insects on it. And so you had sprayed something onto that landscaping plant and then you went and you pruned back that landscaping plant, just doing a routine pruning, and then you put that back into your compost bin. And so it composted, it looked great, but maybe you weren't monitoring your temperature. 
And then you put that compost onto your vegetable bed and it was in very close contact with maybe some lettuce leaves or some carrots. Um, so very in close in contact with that compost. But you weren't monitoring the temperature and that pesticide that had been sprayed on your ornamental plant maybe didn't cook out all the way and then was then in your vegetable garden. So it's just a cautionary note of if you're not going to monitor the temperature very closely, uh, just be cautious with what you use it on in your vegetable garden. Or just, you know, know, well, wait, I sprayed that with this chemical. I should probably maybe throw that away rather than putting it in a compost bin. So that's just kind of a cautionary note. Um, it can be used as a mulch in the garden. So it's a very easy way to sort of pack in that uh, water retention and kind of help the weed seeds from coming up. Um, and then also, if you have lots of planters and lots of pots and you spend a lot of money on potting soil every year, you can actually mix in your compost to about a ratio of a third with your compost, excuse me, a ratio of a third with your potting soil and plant into that uh, and save you a little bit money on potting soil because if you've got a bunch of planters, potting soil can add up quickly. Um, so just a word of caution, I will say too much of anything is a bad thing. Uh, everything in moderation. Um, you know, if we use compost as a soil amendment and it's got nutrients in it, it's got those building blocks in it, and we over apply it and we use it year after year after year, and maybe we're not paying quite as much attention as to what we're putting back into the garden, it can build up too many nutrients into the soil. And particularly, the thing to worry about is too much phosphorus. Um, so, if we have too much phosphorus in the soil, um, it can inhibit plant growth. So if we have, it starts to block some of the other nutrients in the soil and we end up with the sickly plants. So the good idea, y'all know I can't make it through a presentation without talking about soil testing. So the good idea is to routinely check with a soil test, make sure that your phosphorus is not getting excessive. Um, Cause I've had conversations with a few people over the past couple years where they just kept adding compost back to their garden, back to their garden, because it's compost, it's great. It has a ton of benefits, but they hadn't done a soil test in a very long time and the phosphorus had built up too fast, too quickly. Um, and so once you've got too much, it's hard to get rid of it. It's not impossible, but it's hard to get rid of it. So just make sure that you check with a soil test every once in a while to make sure you're still on track. So in conclusion, uh, composting, it's a great way to divert material out of the landfill, um, especially those food scraps that don't break down well in the landfill. Um, it also is a free essential fertilizer for your garden and can improve a lot of issues with soil quality, particularly in problem soils like clayey soils that we are so familiar with here in Cleveland County. There are a ton of different composting setups. You can um, really find any way to make a compost, so there's no excuse, um, is it's my response. But um, so lots of different ways that you can do it and set it up in a way that works for you, is aesthetically pleasing and productive for your garden. Uh, and then vermicomposting, it's another great way um, to compost. It's great for smaller options and creates a great finished product. So you can have fun with worms and uh, can be another great way to get that stuff added back to your soil. So just a couple of resources, uh, check out our fact sheet website. It is a database of all of our fact sheets for OSU Extension. Uh, it's recently been updated and so I think it's a, a lot easier to use now, but you can search, uh, type in a topic that you're interested in and it will bring up all of the fact sheets related to that topic. Um, these are a couple fact sheets from OSU um, that talk specifically about composting. Uh, and I did use these heavily for resources uh, and the material in the presentation this evening. And then as always, check us out on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and so we'll post fun garden tips, things that, that you should be doing. Also, if we see anything that starts to come through the office uh, that's sort of perpetuating in our area, we'll post about that as well. And then we also post about the classes and the workshops that we have. So thank you again. I got us out early tonight. I didn't go over. Um, so
So if you have any questions, I will stick around. I'm happy to answer those, but I appreciate you guys joining me this evening. So we've got one about the sludge. Okay. Could that still be used as compost or soil additive? If it I would dry it out. I would try to get it dried out. Um, add back, add more of those browns back to it, really kind of work it in and try to get it dried out. Um, cause it's just not going to act like compost when you put it in, when you put it back into the soil, it's going to have sort of a different microbial and nutrient content. And so just kind of sort of get it to dry out, break down a little bit more, uh, and loosen up. So okay. the maggots don't break things down in the same way that the bacteria would. They, they break stuff down, but it's just the product that you're going to get is not going to be that black gold necessarily that you get from the microbial or the worms. They're still breaking it down. It's just going to be kind of in a different stage and you sort of want to kind of let it get it finished just a little bit. Okay, great. And can you recommend a good soil kit that we can get on Amazon? Um, you're in Los Angeles, right? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not familiar with any kits. Um, do you know, I'm sure you have a county extension office there. Okay. They should be able to do soil samples for you too. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. All, all extension offices should be able to offer soil samples. Okay. Um, so you might call them and see it because I, I know I'm, I might be sort of selling my own product a little bit, but um, the soil kits that you see at like the Lowe's and the Home Depot's um, or the box stores, you, you get kind of like a range of where your soil is uh, rather than like an exact number. And um, they're about the same price. At least I know it is here. I'm not, I can't speak for the, that county extension office, but they're pretty much the same price as um, the kits that you would get on Amazon or the box stores. Okay. okay, thank you. I would check with your local county extension office. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Are you, you your compost file now? <laughs> are you in a hurry to get off? No. Would you allow me to share my screen really quickly for three things I can just screen let people see quickly on the library's website? Absolutely. I might have to make you the host, which okay. I... Do you still want to record it or do you want to stop that part? It's totally up to you. We can keep recording and then um, I can always edit it out if something goes haywire and we can't figure it out. Okay. I just have to, I think, make you... Oh, no. I tried to see... I think I have to make you the host. Oh, wait, wait, no. Here we go. I found it. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. So, hold on just a second. All right. So, this screen right here is for the people in our library system area, which, um, Andrea, if you wanted to pay for a library card, you would have access to this too. But Hoopla is one of our streaming services. And so in addition to all the great things Courtney shared with your library card, you have access, maybe not the sole compost, but to lots of other different compost resources. And that's just compost alone using that search word. So there'll be lots more gardening items in there for you to be able to see. And then hold on just a second. All right, this is Canopy. Canopy is another one of the library streaming services or the services you can find on our library page. These are all videos and there's 10 pages of videos that somehow compost appears in them that if you're interested in going to watch some videos about that, these are all available. And there's some that are PBS that are back on page one to one also, if that is of interest to you. And let's see, of course, there's lots of different library books that just did a quick search for compost and there's pages and pages of 
books, physical books, and then again, the digital books that you can check out. So if anybody's interested or wants to just look for other things besides compost, let me know. I can connect with you and Courtney and we can take it from there. So that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. I didn't know about Canopy. That's awesome. Yeah, there's tons of stuff on there and kids shows. Mostly I, you know, the parents give me feedback about the canopy and the hoopla and hoopla will have, um, sometimes people use the app on their phone or sometimes they'll add it to their TV. And then it's another option to stream children's shows and things that maybe you don't want to pay for. So, or you don't see in your paid for streaming services. So. Do you know if Canopy has an app? I think so. I know Hoopla does, but. I can double check. I think okay. so. I will find out and let you know. Cool. Thank you. My oh. phone is so old, I can't put more apps on it, so. Oh. <laughs> I understand that problem. All right, well. Um, thank you for joining me tonight, guys. Uh, so we've got, I think, August 4th. Let me check my calendar real quick. All right, August 4th, Tuesday at 6.30 is fall gardening. So if you want to join us for that, um, it's on our Facebook page. Check it out there and join us for that one. That one's a really fun class. It's, um, I like teaching that one. So make sure to join us that night. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next time.